You are watching Wham TV. All for the glory of Jesus Christ. You're tuned in with the underground Christian network. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you went down, I was so secure when you were up here. It was just, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so privileged to be here today and to meet so many precious brothers and sisters in Christ in this church. Um, they just have such a precious spirit here. And it seems that, that all of you do. And I'm just privileged to uh, be among believers and uh, the remnant and those who uh, believe in our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when uh, that young man was singing, you know, when you hear the name of the Lord Jesus and you if a tear doesn't come to your eye, you, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know where your heart is, but I think there are some people whose eyes don't tear. And those are the people that will just candidly take it out of the Bible. And um, those are the people who mocked him, and those are the people who spit on him, and, and their ancestors are, are very much alive today. Um, very briefly, um, I'll tell you a little bit of the testimony about how I wrote the book or why I wrote the book, New Age Bible Versions, and then we'll jump into this um, these questions right here. But um, I was a professor at Kent State University for 10 years. And um, I didn't have any children of my own. And I don't, I'm not women's lib. So I believe women should be keepers at home as best they can. But uh, I had to support myself. I had no family. And so I was supporting myself. And the Lord hadn't given me any children. And I was in my 30s. And I said to the Lord, if you won't give me children, Lord, like other women have, give me souls. And so I went. Um, with a, with a, um, a passion to Kent State University and hoping to get people saved. I was saved there as a graduate student and just so tickled to be saved and just from darkness to light um, and from the power of Satan to the kingdom of his dear son. I empathized with what our brother said here about he, he, you know, he had to get his hands dirty to save me and he brought me out of a horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And I'm so grateful to him that I just assumed after I got saved that everybody would be so excited about getting saved too, but they, unfortunately they're not. But um, when I graduated, I told the Lord that I would, uh, I'd passed out tracts a lot at the university, I had a book table with some other Christians passing out tracts and King James Bibles and that sort of thing. I didn't want to leave because I had a burden for the young ladies, and I knew if someone didn't get a hold of these young ladies, you know, who, who knows where they'd go, probably where I went between the ages of 16 and 26 years old by the time I got in saved. So I'd, I'd tremendous burden for the young women there. So I asked the Lord if he would allow me to stay there at the university, and I assumed it would be in the form of a cleaning lady, and, and I thought that would be fine, because I saw the cleaning women in the halls. I thought, oh, they have great access to the students. You'd get an apron with lots of different tracks, and then you'd have access to the bulletin boards, and you could just track the place up like me, because that's what I had done as a student, you know. And so I thought, well, I'll just keep doing it until I fall over when I'm 65 years old or something. And um, so I prayed, and I, you know, I gave my heart to the Lord to do that, that I would be a cleaning lady. And um, the Lord had a sort of strange turn of events, and I was hired as a professor. So now you know the quality of the professors at Kent State University. You know, it's just... But it, it, was, the Lord's, it was the Lord's hand. He, he, yeah, he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so um, from that point on, I taught there, and I became tenured, and I became a, on the graduate faculty status. And I was there for 10 years with graduate faculty status, reviewing you know, thesis work and that sort of thing. And um, all the time I was there, my purpose was to have people receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So young women would come in my office. I would try to, you know, show them the Bible or something like this. I never pursued the academic whatever. And as I was going along, the Lord would throw these things sort of in the back of the truck. So for all the young people out there, that's a reminder. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You don't have to seek a career. You don't have to to seek financial resources. I just sought souls there at Kent State University. And on the way, he threw in a bunch of honors and a bunch of this. And it's like, I didn't want that. I wasn't looking for that. And he throws it in sort of as a joke on the other people. Sort of. <laughs> That's sort of how he does it. I, mean, I think he has a sense of humor. But um, um, I noticed over, peer, over that tenure of 10 years at the university that the young ladies that I was dealing with who had private time with the Lord every day, 
with a King James Bible. Now, it's not owning a King James Bible. It does absolutely nothing magical to anyone. So if you have a King James Bible and you, know, you have problems, that isn't the fault of the King James Bible. You have to read it. But the young ladies who did have a King James Bible and had a, a private time with the Lord in the morning before they went off to school were able to cope at Kent State University with the boy problems, with the failing chemistry problems, with all these sorts of things. They were able to cope. The young ladies who were using an NIV, having a private time, having devotions with the Lord with an NIV, with an NASB, with a New King James, were coming into my office, and they were a mental wreck, quite frankly. Now, I had, I'd, I'd seen a few things um, about the, you know, the new versions or whatever, but I, did, I wasn't a staunch believer, you know, this is the only Bible and those are bad. I really didn't have any feelings like that right away. It was a pragmatic thing. It was something that I saw with the young people. You have these nervous wreck girls coming in your office and saying, I don't know if I'm really saved. I feel like I'm walking on eggs. I remember one young lady said, I said, well, you feel like you're walking on eggs with the Lord. What do you mean? And she says, I don't know. I'm just a nervous wreck. I don't think I'm saved. I might be saved. I don't know. So I'd show her, you know, you know, you are saved. We'd go through the scriptures, you know, and then she'd go home and I'd say, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. You know, you'll get assurance of salvation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. She'd come back, she'd be worse, you know. And that would, that would be that young lady. And I'd, I'd put that in the back of my mind. And another young lady would be, you know, having problems with this. And Jesus came to heal the broken heart. And I explained to her how precious he is. And I said, um, Jesus, that, you know, God said in the Old Testament, thy maker is thy husband. You know, she wanted a boyfriend. I said, let him be your husband. Oh, no. You know, well, he's not that nice anyway, God. I said, well, he's wonderful. He's precious. He's, oh, no, he's kind of mean. You know, and I was getting this from these people that were using these new versions. And it occurred to me one day when a young lady came in my office and she was crying and she said, um, uh, she'd failed a test and was having boyfriend problems and all that sort of thing. So I got out um, Luke chapter 4 where it says Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. So I said, let's look at this in your Bible, honey. And we opened it up and it wasn't there. It was completely missing in her New American Standard Bible. And I've since come to find out it's not in the NIV either. And so I couldn't show her that. I took her to um, his mind is kept in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And I said, you need to keep your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ like a radio. They're static on every other channel except the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be throughout the course of your life. Adjusting test grades, adjusting boyfriends will not change that static that's on all those channels. And uh, when, I, when I found that I could not sh help this young lady with her New American Standard Bible, I said to the Lord, give me a chance to collate these versions um, so I can see exactly what's going on. Going on. It, it, because it needs to be a collation that's not just... Um, well, this is out and this is out, because that doesn't mean a whole lot. We need to look at every single word in these Bibles in every single version. And I want to collate them and see if there's um, tendencies you know, toward different things going on. So I asked the Lord that, and he gave me a disability. So I spent the next uh, six years in bed, couldn't walk very well, um, couldn't see real well, uh, bad my hands, I couldn't grasp a pencil with my hands. I developed out what's called a connective tissue disease. So I spent six years in bed. And that was his answer to my prayers. In the process of being in bed six years in, in total absolute pain, I mean beyond, you know, 50 on the Richter scale, um, you get real close to God and, you know, it's either real, get real close to God or you just, you just don't make it, you know, I mean, because it's real difficult. But during the course of those six years, I would spend as many hours a day as I could collating the new version, sitting there. The NIV is this, every single word. All right, and it took me a year plus just to do the New American Standard Bible. And I couldn't see real well, and I'm looking, you know, and I like this, and this thumb didn't work. And you know, I, there was no question the devil didn't want me to be doing this, because when you can't see and your thumb doesn't work, and whatever I tried to do, if I had to walk, well, then you can't walk. If I tried to write, well, then you can't write. You know what I'm saying? But um, at the end of the six-year collation, I'd, I'd amassed this, these huge notebooks of what are the differences, and it appeared that the differences were... Uh, purposeful. It appeared that the differences were relating to theologies. Different the theologies in different, you know, were repeating themselves over and over and over again. And so um, I really didn't think women should be writing books on theology and that sort of thing. And I, you know, so I was just going to take my collation to some seminary here and say, you men, do this, you know, fix this and turn this into a book. Maybe it'll be of some use to you or something. But the Lord really um, laid on my heart that I was to put this thing together. And he gave me some verses in the Old Testament uh, in um, the Old Testament says that Sisera oppressed Israel for 20 years. And then God brought Jael, who stayed in her tent. She was a keeper at home. She was where she was supposed to be. He came in to her tent, and she put the tent peg through his head. Okay? And that was the end of him, because it was a head problem. You know, pride. All right? And so it was, 
Uh, now we had the same story. The Lord showed me the same story with Abimelech. Abimelech was the usurper. And um, this, the woman in this tower dropped the millstone on his head. And he said to his um, armor bearer, kill me lest someone say a woman killed me. And he said, this is why we're doing this, Gail. You're going to do this. And I said, whoa, swell. You know? And uh, there was the um, Sheba, Sheba's head, and the, and the wise woman with Joab. So God seems to have, he doesn't use women to teach, he doesn't use women to preach, he just uses women to kill people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, And he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so, but the interesting thing that he showed me was the, um, the uh, NIV came out in 1973. And people would ask me the question, why hasn't the Lord come in with something to tell people how bad the NIV is? I mean, here, this is 20 years here. And the Lord showed me the thing about Sisera. It said, Sisera oppressed Israel for 20 years. So my book... And then there was another, there were three books that came out in 1993, 20 years after the NIV came out exactly, uh, 1993, that came out and really seemed to sort of upset the apple cart for the NIV. And the NIV people have been scrambling ever since. Okay, so the Lord has his time work and he allows what he will allow, just like the ocean waves coming in, but they stop at a certain point. All right, and um, so that was the thinking behind why, why I wrote the book. I as far as some of the things that I found when I was researching, um, I read and read and read, and when I would get books at the library, I would look at the bibliography in the back and order those books through interlibrary loan. I couldn't go to the library, so I had to order things through interlibrary loan. And I would read all those. So in the process of researching it, you know, I probably read hundreds and hundreds of books. But in the process of researching this, I had no preconceived notions about the King James being totally perfect and superior and just absolutely perfect and the other ones being bad. I had no preconceived notions about origin or any of these men, I just simply went into it, you know, raw. And it's almost like, um, you know, Ralph Nader or some of these people going into something and investigating something. You don't get the fox to guard the, the hen house. And so it would be very difficult for someone who graduated from a seminary, been indoctrinated in a certain way of thinking, to objectively look at this. But I was sort of objectively looking at the information because I didn't know what I was to expect. And what I found, the satanic elements, the Luciferian elements were totally surprising to me. I didn't want to read that material. I didn't want to look at that material. I wasn't interested. And I think there are people who have a carnal curiosity about that sort of thing. And I think that's a sin. I don't think that we're to do that sort of thing. But I think that's why the, the Lord let me look at some of those things, because I didn't have that carnal curiosity about those things. So I don't encourage other people to look into those things, you know, unless that's something the Lord uh, specifically tells you to do. But the things that I found were were, were not at all what I expected to found. And the Lord would be, be, you know, sort of giving me little tips like, look for this and look for this. And I go, oh my, you know. So um, I had no preconceived notions and I didn't have an axe to grind or a denominational anything to, to set up. So um, let me put my glasses on here and we'll get, we'll get started with these questions. This is my ammunition pack here. <laughs> this is my sword and we'll take a few heads off if we have to. <laughs> The eyes still aren't so great, but uh, you might wonder, you know, as sick as I was, you know, why am I here today and how am I able to be here today? It's some precious friends who fasted for me that are Mr. and Mrs. Caston and um, their precious uh, sister and brother-in-law who fasted for me. So I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the power of prayer and fasting. And incidentally, fasting is not in the new versions, and I can see why it wouldn't be, because it's a very, very powerful tool. Okay, where did the Catholic Bible come from? So that's, that's the question about where the Catholic Bible come from. Let me briefly give you a little history about um, the manuscripts, okay, and where they came from and what's going on with the Catholic Bible. But, okay, basically, the gentleman's question is where did the Catholic Bible come from? Okay. Um, the Catholic Bible being the New Testament coming from uh, the Greek text and the Old Testament coming from the Hebrew text. Okay, um, we'll just look at the the uh, Greek text first. But in the Greek text, we have about 5,200 extant Greek manuscripts. Okay, now of those 5,200 extant Greek manuscripts, all right, 99% would agree with the King James Bible. 
All right. In fact, it's, not, it's more than 99% would agree with the King James Bible. And that text type in the Greek New Testament. Okay, 1% would agree with what our questioner is asking about the Catholic Bible. 1% would agree with that text. Now, um, the Roman Catholic text that's now used um, was created, I believe, at Alexandria, Egypt, okay, at a Neoplatonic school. Clement, Origen, those gentlemen were Neoplatonists. All right, Neoplatonists is, is that type of theology that seeks to join or conjoin Christianity with Platonism. It's called Neoplatonism. That's what these gentlemen hope to do, intellectualize um, the Christian faith. But at Alexandria, Egypt, where they had a school, they created some manuscripts. Now, we have those manuscripts extant today. They're not really manuscripts. They're more or less fragments. But we have those manuscripts extant today in what are called P66, P75, and probably 92 other papyra. Okay. Now, the, uh, those papyra were discovered in a city that's probably within 80 miles of Alexandria, Egypt. And so that, that, that critical text, or those gentlemen took the, the Greek text that was created by the apostles, and when it went down to Alexandria, Egypt, which is sort of the um, crossroads of every religion and every cultural kind of thing that's, that's happening in the world, when it went down to Alexandria, Egypt, they took that text and they tried to make it match um, Alexandrian philosophy. They tried to make it match Neoplatonic philosophy. So, for instance, when the King James Bible said, God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, okay? Now, a Christian would believe God who created all things by Jesus Christ. But the new versions just say God who created all things, period. They drop by Jesus Christ. Now, the reason they do that is because when they took that down in Alexandria, Egypt, a Platonist would not believe that the world was created by Jesus Christ because that would mean that Jesus Christ was co-eternal with the Father. Okay, so he could not have been a part of that. He was not eternal. They, there was some Arian influence there. There was some Docetic influence there uh, where the Christ pole came on Jesus Christ at his baptism and all that sort of thing. And so they would not believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. So they'd have to cut that part out. Okay, uh, where, the, where the Bible does, as a matter of fact, say 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. They had to take God out because they didn't believe God was manifest in the flesh. The Gnostics would not believe that God would touch matter, so they'd have to change that God. So we'd have to change that to who was manifest in the flesh. Well, since they're not too smart, they didn't put a, uh, a subject with that sentence. And it's really he. So, so now the NIV says he who was manifest in the flesh. Well, no Greek text in the whole entire world says he who was manifest in the flesh. So they put the he who in there to make it a correct grammatical sentence. Well, God knows how to make correct grammatical sentences. He said God was manifest in the flesh. Okay, he didn't say who. There are some manuscripts there, about 300, that say God. Um, there are less than a handful that say who or which. All right, none of them say he who, but that's what you have today in the NIV and the NASB, he who. So no Greek manuscript in the world has ever said he who was manifest in the flesh. They have a grammatical error there and they don't know what to do with it and so they just they just paraphrase or dynamic equivalency is what they call it. That's not equivalent to anything. But anyway, that text moved up to Caesarea and um, there was a library there, Origen's library, and Pamphilius was a student of Origen. Pamphilius took that text for Eusebius. Now Eusebius was a semi-Aryan. He was a sort of a politician. It was sort of like Constantine is the ruler politically uh, Eusebius was his false prophet. Okay, now it, just like political correctness today, they wanted to placate the Catholics, or not the Catholics, we'll say the pagans, uh, synonymous. But they wanted to placate the Catholics, <laughs> the, the pagans. I'm sorry, the pagans. They wanted to placate the Christians because the Christian population was was growing and growing and growing, and so they would be what they called semi-Arians. Well, we don't want to be an Arian. We would not want to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So we'll be a semi-Arian. You know, what I mean, it was just a po political kind of thing. But anyways, you see, this was a semi-Arian. So he saw in Origins, um, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, he saw, well, they weren't Origins, but I mean they were his text type, okay? They saw in those manuscripts something that would placate both the pagans and the Christians. We have God who created all things. Well, that'll make everybody happy. It just didn't say by Jesus Christ, okay? And it wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ, it's just Jesus or something like this. So we can placate the Christians because we'll have a little bit of Jesus in there, and we'll have a little bit of God created things in there, and then we'll 
placate the Neoplatonic people and all those people because we'll cut off some of those distinctively Christian things. And that's why this text type is so popular today and so popular and probably going to be used as far as this one world Bible is concerned because it does that. It's got Jesus Christ in there to placate the Christians, but it's also got the other things that are what I call inclusive, that allow the Bible to... Um, be agreeable with other religions. Okay, Christianity is exclusive. You know, no one, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. Yeah. Uh, the New World religion is inclusive. We, we will include Christians. We will include all these sorts of people. Okay? So that's why their Bibles, you, you'll see as you go through it, people say, well, there, there's still some good things in there. There's still a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Well, of course there is. Because in the inclusive New World religion, we, we'll, we'll accept Christians. Now, we wouldn't want to accept anyone who said, Theirs was the only way, so please don't say that. But we will accept Jesus Christ, and we'll just add him to our little you know, panorama of uh, God. So back to the Catholic Bible. Where did it come from? Okay. Um, um, Eusebius asked Pamphilius to write these manuscripts. Now, it was at the command of Constantine. Supposedly, there were 50 made. They made the Sinaiticus, and they made the Vaticanus manuscripts as part of these 50 manuscripts that were made. Okay. Now... Uh, extant today are just Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Okay. Now, an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know, there was a monk um, in the 1700s, who, and there was a big controversy in the 1700s, but none of us know this now, okay, because it's all sort of died down. But that monk said in the 1700s when Tichendorf and Tregellis and all these people were unearthing uh, the Sinaiticus manuscripts, so-called discovering it, this monk said that he just wrote it, okay? So when people say, to you, oh, we have this, this manuscript from 330, it's the oldest and it's the best manuscript. Well, looking back at the literature around 1700, there was a huge controversy because this monk was saying, I just wrote this, I just wrote this. Well, most people don't know about that. You go through seminary, you never hear about that. But if you read enough of 16th, 17th, 18th century literature, it's, it's all right there. And so and the other interesting thing about Sinaiticus that they just uh, sort of figured out, Sinaiticus is the raison d'etre why... They had the big black line in the NIV. The NIV says in Mark 16, those last few verses don't really belong there. Okay, so the big black line there, based on the Sinaiticus manuscript. Okay. Now, we've just discovered, looking at the Sinaiticus manuscript, counting the letters per line and the lines per page, that that page is a forgery. That page was not a part of the original Sinaiticus document. Because what the person tried to do is like, okay, we've got to get from, in other words, the original Sinaiticus had the ending in um, Mark 16. It had the ascension and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at some point in history, when they didn't want that part of the Bible in there, they said, let's get someone to redo those, that folio page. But they ha what you have to do is, if you're going to take out those verses, you've got to get, got to, you've got to get a work so that it works out that the last word on the last page is what you want it to be so that when you turn the page over, it's the next word. So they had to change the spacing of the words per line, lines per column. And so, you know, no one's ever bothered to check that before. And at the Majority Text Society down in uh, Texas, you know, that was a presentation given, and they were showing that this, has, in fact, is what, it, what has happened. So the, the great reason, Detroit, why um, some of the things are being omitted in new versions, the more you explore into it, the, the reasons don't even hold water. But anyway, the Catholic Bible came from that Vaticanus and that Sinaiticus manuscript text type. Okay, now, when it moved into the Catholic Church, it moved into the Catholic Church, obviously, in the form of Latin text, because the Latin text is the, the language of, of the Roman Empire and Rome during that period, okay? And so, like, those two manuscripts and that text type, okay, were never used by the Church, by the body of believers, okay? Uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus laid Purdue. No one really used them till 14, 15, 16, 1700. So you have thousands of years where we never have anyone using this text type. The only church that used this text type, truncated, by that I mean God who created all things by Jesus Christ, cutting that off. I call it a truncated text type. The only people who used that were the Catholic Church. Now we know the Catholic Church doesn't use the Bible. All right, they keep it or they have it or they draw it or whatever, but they don't use the Bible. So that text type has never, the text type with 64,000 missing words, which is what we have in the NIV today, was never used by the church. Okay, And so we have 
um, the witness of history against that text type. Because why would God leave his church without the word of God for 1,400 years? And then all of a sudden, something's going to be discovered. Okay, we have the discovery now of the papyri that were created at a school about 80 miles away from Alexandria. In the 1700s, 1800s, we have the not just discovery, but the use of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, several manuscripts. Um, so the Catholic Church has been the harbinger of that text type. Now the reason they liked that text type was because it was Neoplatonic. If you study the history of the Catholic Church, you'll find out that there, throughout history, Bessarion, the bishop, is the one who kept in his library the Vaticanus manuscript before Vaticanus became popular. And he, was a, he was a Neoplatonist. And so if you really study what was going on in the Catholic Church, they've always been involved in the mystery religions and mysticism, Catholic mysticism. Okay, and this is what they're trying to do to us again today. Okay, as soon as the word of God was brought into the languages of the world, the English language, the Spanish languages, all these other languages, we have people set free from what was called the Dark Ages, 500 to 1500 were called the Dark Ages. Okay, how did they keep those people in bondage? They kept them in bondage two ways. Okay, they kept them in bondage by saying, you can't understand the Bible in your own language. The Bible doesn't exist in your own language. You need a language scholar to tell you what it really means. You don't have it in your little Bible that you carry around. Little mommy and has her little Bible. God is in the business of deceiving housewives. He will not give them the real Bible. Only language scholars have the real Bible. And it's in little bits and pieces all around in all the lexicons in the world. Okay, But that's what they did. They moved it, the priesthood of believers away from the believer into the scholar. Okay, that's the way they did it. And they did it with the Latin language. Okay, they said that you, we're going to chain the Bible to the pulpit and people can't have it. And the second way they did it is they moved the culture from a word-based culture, which is what we have here, a word-based culture, to an image-based culture. They said, God isn't in the, in the Word of God. It's images. And so we're going to have little dolly pictures and little statues and all this sort of thing. Well, the culture, we are being moved from a word-based culture to an image-based culture where children don't sit and study a King James Bible and mothers perhaps don't explain to them what does shame-facedness mean, okay? They pop in a Jesus video and that's, it's the image, it's a picture of Jesus. Well, Jesus didn't really look like that and, you know, it was produced by the Mormon church and all these other sort of things. But I'm just saying, it's an image-based culture from a word-based culture. And so we'll have a perfect example of that would be the New King James. The New King James has a logo on the front and this little doo-doo here. I don't know if you can all see it. But they say in the front that this is a symbol for the Trinity. Okay? But the interesting thing about it is they take the Trinity out of the Bible. So we go from pictures to, you know, now the, the very, very verse, Acts 17, 29, that says, we ought not to think the Godhead is like anything graven by art. So it's telling us not to make images of the Godhead. And so the New King James takes that out. They take the Godhead out of that verse. Now the word Godhead is, is a very Trinitarian verse. It shows the multiple nature of the Godhead. Okay, three gods in one person. All right, the word Godhead. They take the word Godhead out of there in the New King James and they, and, and that very verse that, that talks about their little picture here. You know, we'll talk about this if we have enough time later about what that little picture really is. But um, the Catholic Bible, back to what the Catholic Bible is. Um, so since Catholics didn't really read their Bible, um, this text type has sat Purdue. Now what's happened today with the Latin manuscripts that, rep that are representative in the Roman Catholic Bible is they're at the Baron Institute, which is, um, I believe it's in Germany, and I could be wrong about that, but it is in Europe. But the Baron Institute is a cloister of men who do nothing but collate Latin manuscripts. Now at the Baron Institute, you have 10,000 Latin manuscripts. Now those 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 6,000 have never been collated. No one's ever gone through them. All right. Now when you look at a Nestle's apparatus or a Greek text from you know the, the opposition side, the Nestle's Greek or the United Bible Societies, and then they have the little footnotes at the bottom. Okay. And they will um, say the Latin text or the Roman Catholic Bible does not have 1 John 5, 7 as an example. Okay. But they don't tell you what is that a collation of. That is a collation of 25 Latin manuscripts. The Oxford edition is a collation of 25 Latin manuscripts. 10,000 manuscripts there um, are, are there. There are 10,000 manuscripts there. They're not collating them. 
Okay. Now, I think part of the problem is, number one, it's a cloister. A cloister is a Roman Catholic setup where you don't go out. You weren't allowed out. So once these people see these 10,000 manuscripts, they can't go out and tell anybody, well, they all have 1 John 5, 7, and because they do. Because um, I believe it was Scrivener back in the 1800s said that 40 out of 50 Latin manuscripts had 1 John 5, 7. But in the Oxford edition, we're going to tell people that it isn't in. All right. Now, I can go into lots of details about that. But basically, the Catholic, man the Catholic Bible is... Um, based on Vaticanus Sinaiticus, the papyrus is a truncated text. You'll see it in Latin manuscripts. Um, it's the Western type, like manuscript D in some cases, but it's a truncated Bible. Um, it's, it's got enough majority text readings in it to make it look like a Bible. Um, there are places in it, in fact, the old Douay, the old Catholic Bible, is better than the NIV is today. So that just shows you how bad things, it's inch by inch by inch by inch. If you get an old Douay, they've got fuller readings. They've got more of the Bible in there than they actually do in an NIV today. So it just shows you the progressive inch by inch nature that's, that the devil, devil uses. Do you find that there is an evil spirit associated with these other versions and the people that voice their approval and backing of them? How are some of the ways you have been attacked for voicing your approval of the 1611? Um, the question about do I find that there's an evil spirit associated with it? We have to remember that um, Satan's attack was on the word of God in Genesis chapter 3. He really didn't say, come commit adultery come rob a grocery store, uh, come cheat on your taxes. He didn't say any of those things. He said, yea, hath God said. So he is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. He is an evil spirit. He's described as an evil spirit. And so his plan of attack has been questioning the word of God. Now, he didn't even say, God didn't say that, period. He said, yea, hath God said. So the question mark, it's the very first question mark in the Bible. It looks like a serpent hanging from a tree with an eyeball at the end of it. Yea, hath God said. It's just a question. Okay, now once we question the word of God, then we can do anything we want to with robbing the grocery store and committing adultery and all these sorts of things because we can, it, it's, all, it's all loose. And so it's the spirit that works in the children of disobedience um, that is working in some of the people who are changing these new versions. I don't think they're the least bit aware of of the conspiratorial nature, but the conspiratorial nature is from Genesis chapter 3. It's the devil. It isn't uh, where men sit around having seances, writing Bible versions at the same time. But here's what happens. Satan says, and you know, the question was asked, what ways have you been attacked for voicing your approval? Um, when Jesus came in a lowly form, meek and lowly, okay, his Bible is in a meek and lowly form. He will not be associated with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. Okay, he will not be associated with that. He will not try to draw people with any of those things. He will be in a lowly form. And as Christians, we have to get used to being in a lowly form. Keep low. You know, like when you're in the army, they say, keep your head down, keep low. That's the way you have to do it. And the world doesn't want to do that. And Satan, he says to the people, he says to people once they become Christians, you're going to get a lot of heat out there with the son of righteousness. You're going to get a lot of heat. Come under the tree of wisdom and there's some shade. And so we have people moving into the New King James. We have people moving to the Hodge Farnstead Majority Text. There's a little bit too much heat out there because when you are hid in the Beloved, which is Jesus Christ, and you are closest to His heart, which is the Word of God, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you will take heat like you have never taken it in your life. And so what, what has happened, it's just inconsequential because what has happened to me is like nothing compared to what has happened to Christians throughout history being tortured during the Dark Ages. And, uh, you know, someone says something bad about you or lies about you. It's like that's nothing compared to physical torture that, that people have gone through for the word of God. So uh, we're all, you know, I'm a wimp, uh, you know. So, um, okay. Uh, could you please say why some really good men are so deceived by the many Bible versions? Okay. I'd like to give you a few Bible verses about, about that because uh, the Bible says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. 
Okay, and so whenever you're working with someone and trying to help them out as best and as often as you can, it's best to use the Word of God. That's the weapon that God uses, the sword of the Spirit. Now, the AV, 1611, is the atomic version. Boy, it's powerful, all right? Now, it says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The devil doesn't want his strongholds pulled down, so he's had this campaign since Genesis chapter 3 to she the sword, more or less. Remember in the Old Testament in Samuel where it said there was no smith found in the land? The Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords. Okay, He didn't want people to have weapons, and he doesn't want them to have the weapon, which is the word of God now. And so there are good men that are deceived, but there were good men that were deceived historically, and people have to have a biblical understanding about this. Now, look at Paul as an example in First Timothy. He says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I would say the average Christian in the pew who's using a new version is doing it 100% totally ignorantly, and they, perhaps they just don't know. So they can obtain mercy. And I mean, I, used, I remember when I was first saved, I didn't know. I used, I'd write letters to my mother. I was trying to get her saved. And I'd change the Bible any time I wanted to. I didn't know any better. You know, babes do a lot of funny, funny things. Do you know what I'm saying? But um, now, so when I say I, uh, about obtaining mercy because they did it ignorantly, a lot of men have turned around. A lot of organizations have turned around because they did it ignorantly. Um, the owners of the exclusive video rights to the NIV called me, and it's called Watchword Productions, and the gentleman said, after I read New Age Bible verse, he said, I can't go on with this production of this NIV and this New King James, these um, cartoons and all this he was making. I'm sure he had millions of dollars tied up in it. He had signed the contract to get the exclusive video rights for this, and had prepared these films and all that sort of things, and was just ready to come out with it. He read my book, and he goes, I've got to throw this all away. I can't do it. I've got to break a contract with Zondervan and these people. It's going to cost me my fortune. It's going to cost me everything, but I cannot do it now. So there are people who are, are coming back around. Uh, Bill Gothard called me several times, and he's, he's always been you know, leaning toward the King James, but he just sort of, after reading the book, he's leaning all the way now. He was recently at a men's seminar. I think he was talking to thousands and thousands of men. He said, you know, if you've got an NIV, throw it away. And so he's been turned around. Um, I was just up at Hiles Anderson, and uh, Dr. Hiles said that Curtis Hudson, who was editor of The Sword of the Lord, had read my book, and that was the book that turned him around back stronger to the King James Version. So there are people that are simply doing it ignorantly in unbelief. They just don't, didn't have the facts. Perhaps they weren't you know, presented in seminary or something like this. So there are plenty of precious people out there. In fact, there was a gentleman named Marv Steffens, who um, raised the million dollars or so it took to get the CEV, Contemporary English Version, off the, on the market. And he called me, he said, I read your book. He goes, boy, we're in trouble, aren't we? He goes, man, I just got the CEV going. I, sp I, I raised all the million dollars for it. And, he, uh, and he's just a precious, precious man. He just didn't know any better. So lots of people are admitting that they're wrong. So the question, you know, about good men being deceived. Remember in Acts chapter 5, it said about um, Peter that he was so spiritual that when he'd go by people, that his shadow would heal people, you know? And remember Barnabas. It said he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. So what, what more could you ask of a Christian being a good man, full of the Holy Ghost? You know, if your shadow healed people, I guess, you know, way back then, that would be fine. But in Galatians 2.14, it says, They, those two gentlemen, walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So we have a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, who, another man whose shadow could heal people, that were in error, but they were good men and they were full of the Holy Ghost. And so good men can be deceived. Um, another good example would be Peter, when uh, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And so the Father had just revealed something to Peter about Jesus being the Christ. The next sentence Jesus Christ said to Peter was, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't say, Satan, get away from Peter. He called Peter Satan, okay? And so if we would, he was saying that Peter was being satanic. And two minutes earlier, he just, the whole, the father had just revealed something to him, which goes to show, you know, how frail our flesh is and how malleable we are either way, you know what I mean, at any given moment and what could happen. Remember Joshua. Now, you're not going to find anyone much better than Joshua in the Old Testament. But you've got the Gibeonites coming in, the dry, moldy bread, he was deceived, and I think some very fine men are deceived by the dry, moldy bread of these new versions because they haven't, uh, you know, God didn't bless them with six years in bed collating. And if they had collated like I had, they would be livid like I'm livid. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, what a blessing. But remember, even Mary and Joseph went a day's journey. 
without Jesus. I mean, that's his very mother. That's her flesh and blood. And they went a whole day without him. And so some of these people are just off running and their whole day or maybe a whole 10 years and they don't know that Jesus isn't with them. And, and perhaps they have the best intentions and, and all that sort of thing. There's, there's three verses, if I can, or four verses, if I might read to answer that question. I think it's real helpful using Scripture. Um, Hosea 7, 13. Though I have redeemed them, it's a saved person, Yet they have spoken lies against me. Now imagine that. Okay, these aren't Satanists speaking lies against God. Okay, this is an Adolf Hitler speaking lies against God. It says, though I have redeemed them, saved people, washed in the blood of the Lamb, they have spoken lies against me. You know, so there are saved people who have spoken lies against God. I mean, it's, it's a, a dichotomy. It's strange. It's hard to understand. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter three: I saw under the sun the place of righteousness. So that would be some of these radio and TV preachers that we've, some, I said some, few radio and TV preachers that we see um, that everyone knows about or heads of schools or whatever. The, the place of righteousness is there, okay? The righteousness through Christ. So it says, and iniquity was there, okay? The place of righteousness and iniquity was there. Right along with righteousness was iniquity, okay? Job uh, 32 verse 5 says, great men are not always wise. Okay, we have to keep that one wise. Um, now, here, here's the last verse I'd like to give answering that question. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 5. Um, someone said, I will get me unto the great men and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. So some great men have done that, you know. Um, now, remember Apollos in, in the scriptures, it says he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. Uh, taught diligently the ways of the Lord, fervent in the Spirit, instructed in the way of the Lord. There's not too much more you could say about someone than what you could say about Apollos, but it says Priscilla and Aquila um, expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. I mean, he heaven forbid there was Priscilla <laughs> helping this brilliant man. Do you know what I'm saying? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's the great leveler. Okay. And, um, okay. Um, Two quick, quick, two quick things I'll add to this about, remember Eli, okay, he was chosen of God. He was used of God. But it says his eyes began to wax dim. And I suspect some of these great men, their eyes have begun to wax dim. And when a young person who didn't, Samuel, didn't let any of his words fall to the ground, okay, the old prophet said, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. And the church is asleep today. And I think... Um, when they wake up, they're going to find themselves in the arms of Delilah, okay? Because Delilah cut the covenant, which was his hair. We're allowing the covenant to be cut today, which is the word of God. And the church is going to wake up in the arms of the Roman Catholic Delilah. And um, I'm afraid that's what's happening. And remember in 1 Kings 13, there was a counterfeit altar, okay? God sent a man to tell everyone there's a counterfeit altar. We don't want to worship at the counterfeit altar. Okay? And on the way, it says an old prophet. It doesn't say an old Baal worshiper. It doesn't say an old reprobate, an old bum, an old drunk. It says an old prophet. Stop and said, you don't have to go. You don't have to listen to what God said. Don't do what God said. Come in and have something to eat. The young man listened to the old prophet. And when he went out, the lion slew him. But what happens is he was sitting under a tree. He wasn't studying. He wasn't working. He was just listening to the old prophet. In the church today, what has happened is we're moving toward that Roman Catholic hierarchy where we abdicate our minds, sit with the remote control, and let the, the TV and the radio preachers tell us what to think, you know. And, I mean, Adolf Hitler would have loved it. <laughs> it's just like... But um, Revelation chapter 3, it says, Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So there are people who have a big name, you know, but they're dead. Okay. All right. What is the confusion about different Greek text sources for Scripture? Okay. Um, now, let me give you something here about the early manuscripts. Okay. Different text sources. Now, as I said... There were there are five thousand manuscripts. Let me give you some quickly some information about percentages. Okay, um, text sources to give us those five thousand Greek manuscripts. We have um, probably ninety two papyra. Those are the oldest manuscripts. All right. If you look at those papyra, eighty five percent agree with the King James Bible. All right, and only fifteen percent agree with the 
new, uh, new versions, okay? The uncials, those are a little bit older. Those are block capital letters, okay? 97% of the uncials agree with the King James Bible. All right, only 3% agree with the new versions, all right? Look at the cursives. Those are a little bit later. That's when people were starting to write in longhand. Uh, 2,000 cursives. 99% agree with the King James Bible. 1% agrees with the new version. So why would anyone use a new version? Okay, looking at the lectionaries, approximately 2,000 lex lectionaries, 100% of the lectionaries agree with the King James Bible. So you have 99% on one side, 1% on the other side. Okay, now these, uh, these scholars have just gone through this tremendous embarrassment because they have been basing their Greek text type, the Nestles, and the UBS Greek text type on that 1% or 2% of the manuscripts. All right? But they said they had the oldest, and they did. Up until about 1950, they had Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Those were the oldest manuscripts. And so it appeared for King James Bible believers that we weren't supported by the oldest manuscripts. Okay, it appeared that way. Now, what happened was in the 50s and 60s, uh, about 92 papyri were collated. They were discovered, as I said, about 80 miles away from this Alexandrian um, school of mysticism in Egypt. They were collated. And as these unsaved scholars start collating them, the president of the University of Chicago was one of the general who did it, Mr. Caldwell, starts collating these. And he said, mercy, these are vindicating the King James Bible. They're vindicating the King James Bible. What happened was, in the Nestle's 20... Uh, fourth edition, as we move to, to the 25th, moving on to the 26th edition, after these papyri were all collated. Now, these papyri are dated 180 AD, 220 AD, so very, very old manuscripts. They found all these King James readings. Okay, they found so many King James readings that they had to change their Greek text type in 500 places. So when you get to the Nestle's 26th edition of their Greek text, okay, based on those one or two little manuscripts, there are 500 places where they had to go back to the King James readings, like pure heart. The King James always said to have a pure heart, okay, in 1 Peter 1, 22. And it always said pure heart. Well, we just didn't have old manuscript evidence to prove that that was right, but the King James said pure heart. Okay. Well, the King James Bible believers were trying to have a pure heart, and they were just trying to have a heart kind of a deal and give to the community chest or something. But... When they discovered P66, P75, and started looking at some of these, there it was, pure heart, 180 AD, all right? So 500 places they had to go back to the King James reading. Now, when you look at the NIV, the NIV is from a 30-year-old Nestle's Greek 23rd edition. It didn't get these papyrological updates. Now, it got a few of them, but it didn't get a lot of them, okay? The NASB is even older than that. The NASB was from a 40-year-old Nestle's 21st edition. So the NA people were running around with the NASBs and NIVs thinking that they had, you know, the, the latest research. And they, it, it turns out that they were all wrong all that time as soon as they started collating these papyra. And so they were just terribly... As a matter of fact, in the oldest, one of the oldest papyra in the world, P66, the president of the University of Chicago found out where people had erased a King James text type reading and replaced it with another one. So the underside, the under reading was the King James text type and they had replaced it with another one. So at that time, you know, Paul says we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So um, uh, the differences between Greek textual sources um, so about different Greek text sources. Did I, did I answer that question, who, who, a person who asked that? About different Greek text. So, okay, oh, I know what I'm... Sometimes I'm not rolling off with all wheels here. Um, as far as Greek text types. Now, so we know that the King James is from the majority text. It comes from the majority of manuscripts. But there's a fraud on the market today. It's called the Harge Farnstead Majority Greek Text. Okay, if we've got 99% of the Greek manuscripts on our side, and they've got 1%, all right, this rubber crutch they're trying to lean on. Well, then we should have a Bible from 99% of these manuscripts, shouldn't we? Well, it's two scholars, several scholars, have come out with something called the majority text. And they're selling it today. You have a new King James Bible in the 1983 edition, not the 1979 edition. They have this giant M, okay? And when you see that giant M, if you're a pastor or a seminary student or something, you say, Oh, the King James in 1,800 places doesn't agree with this majority text type. Oh, dear. We, well, no wonder we have to go to the New King James. I just knew we did. <laughs> I mean, something like that. Okay, let me explain to you what the Hodge Farnstead majority text is from. It is from a collation done in 1904. Talk about updated, okay? 1904. If somebody can't come up with something better than 1904. I don't know why. But, uh, by Von Soden. Von Soden took basically 414 manuscripts. Not... 
manuscripts. It took 414, collated them. In some places, he only took 13. Okay, Maurice Robinson out of Southeastern found places where he only took 13 manuscripts and collated them. This collation is now sitting in the New King James, pretending to be the majority text. Okay, now uh, Frederick Weiss did an article called The Profile Method, and when he took 99 text, 99 places. Let's look at Von Soden. Let's look at this collation. How accurate was he? 99. 76 places he found where he either listed something that shouldn't have been listed or he left out something that should have been there. In other words, he misrepresented 76% of the time. So not only is it a collation of approximately 414 manuscripts, he misrepresented it 76% of the time. So the so-called majority text is whatever. So if you go to a bookstore, if you go to a seminar, and you're looking for a Greek text, they'll try to sell you this Nestles or this UBS that's based on one, less than 1% 1 of the manuscripts, or now they're going to try to sell you, you know, the, the Bible believers are getting educated. So they know that's not any good anymore. So we're going to have another counterfeit to slip under the rug for them. We'll give them this majority text. Well, they don't tell you the history of where did that exactly come from, how weak that is. Now, there's something new coming out of Southeastern. It's called uh, Robinson Pierpoint Majority Text, and he's going to come up with a new translation. And he's going to use Thayer's lexicon. Okay. Now, everyone and their brother is using Thayer's lexicon. If you have a copy of the Barry's Interlinear Textus Receptus, if you're a seminary student or a pastor, okay, now we know we don't want the Nestle's Greek text. We know we don't want the United Bible Society's Greek text. So we're going to use Barry's Interlinear Textus Receptus it's based on the King James. But does anyone look in the back and read, where did Barry get those literal translations? Barry got those literal translations from J. Henry Thayer. J. Henry Thayer was a Unitarian. He spent the entire portion of his life trying to destroy Christianity. If you research during that period when J. Henry Thayer lived, you will find that he was the enemy of Christianity at that time. So now, slipped in to this Greek text that the King James Bible believers are teaching their seminary students with, they see this literal translation. It goes, well, does, is that literally what it means? No, that's what J. Henry Thayer, the Unitarian. Unitarian just means they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So, so basically what I what I t explain to people about Greek text sources and Greek text is that the English Bible is God's word for English speaking people. Okay, you know, we're not Greek and so uh, when someone says, you know, what does the Greek say? I say, you don't read Greek. Um, you read English out of a lexicon. <laughs> and who wrote that lexicon? You know, when pastors look for deacons in a church, they don't go up to the bus station and see who comes out of the revolving door next. Okay, it says lay hands on no man suddenly. You know, you check that person, you watch that person. But this is what's happened within the body of Christ. We have uh, Barry's interlinear with Thayer's definitions in there. Does anyone look, study Thayer? Who is Thayer? Who is this man? Strong. Okay, oh, we swear by Strong. Of course, now he's got a great collation there. But his Greek definitions, Thayer was on the American Standard Version Committee. Thayer was an arch liberal. Okay, look into the lives of some of these men. You can do it very, very easily at any you know seminary library and find out were they believers. You know, get get me a testimony. Uh, Briggs, you know, the Briggs is a is a big resource for Greek scholars and Greek students. Briggs was, was at the a speaker at the Parliament of World Religions, and so it's like, uh, -uh. <laughs> okay. Um, So, uh, someone asked, did you know about the theological conspiracy against the King James when your work started, or did you discover this at the release of your book? Um, the, the conspiracy, what, I just discovered things as I was going. I had no ideas about anything. <laughs> okay, Monica's an answer a question. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> oh, why Easter instead of Passover, Acts? Passover was done with... Matthew 24, 3, world should be age. Okay. Um, why Easter? Now, there are two different ways you can approach that. All right? And I'll give you both of them. But I think, but I think you know, there, there's some merit in both of them. Um, in the New Testament, we have the word Pascha. All right? And 20-some or a dozen, two dozen times, it's translated Pasha. All right? Now, when we get to uh, the word Easter in the book of Acts, let me see if I can get... Exactly. When we get to the book Easter or, or uh, Acts 12:4, okay, all of a sudden, 20, you know, 22 some other times or 28 times, it's translated Pascha, it's translated Passover. Here we're translating an Easter, so people say that's an error in the King James Bible. Okay, now if you look at Acts 12 verse 4, okay, 
and where it says, um, intending after Easter to bring him forth. Everyone uses that as, well, we've proven an error in the King James Bible because we've got the word Pascha here. 28 other times it's translated Passover. It should be translated Passover here, so we've got it as Easter. So the King James is wrong. Now, some, somebody with a, a year of Greek thinks that they're a genius, as if the King James translators had a drunken binge that day and go, oh, how should we translate Pascha? I forget. Well, let's try Easter. You know what I mean? It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But anyway, the thing that unlocks the mystery is verse 4. Look back up at verse 4 at the beginning. It says, these were the days of unleavened bread. Okay, now, Easter is over. Excuse me, Passover is over. Passover is on the 14th. Easter is the 15th through the 21st. So, Passover was over. It couldn't be Passover. Because these were the days of unleavened bread. And I can give you some Bible verses uh, to explain it. If you have a pencil, Deuteronomy 16, verse 1 through 8. Uh, 2 Chronicles 8, verse 13. Uh, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 15 and 21. And Ezra 6, verse 19. Okay, now the Passover was passed when Peter was arrested, so it couldn't have been the Passover. All right? And so Herod was an Edomite. And Edomites were Babylonian celebrated the feast of Ishtar, Ashtarte. So Easter is the correct word there. Now that's one explanation of why that is still correct. Because Herod was talking not about Passover, because Passover was over. Herod was talking about Ishtar, the feast of, um, you know, this Babylonian whatever. Now that's one answer. Now the other answer is, is sort of etymological. Looking at the etymology, that means the history of the word, the word Easter, you will find that it does not come from Ishtar, Astarte. It comes from the word East. Okay. If you look in Tyndale's Bible, um, if you look in Tyndale, he will say 14 times, instead of saying Passover lamb, he says Easter lamb. He spells it E-S-T-E-R, Easter lamb. Okay. Um, he actually, Tyndale, coined the word Passover. All right. So the word Passover as an English word was never used until Tyndale's time. But even in Luther's Bible, Jesus was called the Easter Lamb, the Easter Lamb, all over the German Bible, the Easter, Easter, Easter Lamb. And so tracing back the etymology of Easter, it's East, the sun rises in the East, it's, uh, you know, the blood red's coming up and Jesus is coming up. So either, either way you look at it, you can say Easter is not a bad word. The etymology comes from the word East. Uh, Tyndale, who you know, died at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church, did not think it was a Catholic word. Okay. Or you can look at the other side. You can say it's from Ishtar, and it was Herod was, was an Edomite, and he was celebrating this feast day. So either way, now we don't know. You know. We see through a glass darkly. We don't know exactly what it is. But it's not a wrong translation. If someone would say to you, well, the King James is in, inconsistent there, I would point them to um, Acts chapter 7, verse 45. Okay, in the new versions... The Greek word there is Jesus, okay? But now they change it in all the new versions to Joshua because they say, well, Jesus couldn't have led them through the wilderness. Well, the Bible says Jesus led them through the wilderness. It doesn't say Joshua led them through the wilderness because if you study all those types in the Old Testament, read the Old Testament, every place where it says Joshua's name, stick in Jesus and look at the dates and look at what happened. I mean, it'll just curl your hair. I mean, he's, it's a prophetic of bringing the people out of the sin, okay? And so the King James Bible is showing that. The Greek word there is the Greek word Jesus. But, but oh no, we can't say that. We've got to have a dynamic ex equivalency because it didn't mean Jesus brought them out of the wilderness. Well, he certainly did bring them out of the wilderness. You know what I mean? It was a pillar by, by day and a, and a flame by night. And so that was a, the precious Lord Jesus Christ. And there are probably, let's see, 6,000 dynamic equivalencies in the New International Version. 6,000 places where they do what I just told you. They ignore the Greek word there. The Greek word may be Jesus. They'll ignore it. The Greek word may be he. They'll put Jesus there. 6,000 places. Now that is not like some number I just made up. That was done from a word for word collation. 6,000 places in the New International Version. Actually, it's more like 6,666, truthfully. That was the number. Um, <laughs> The NASB has 4,000 of those so-called dynamic equivalencies. And the New King James has 2,000 dynamic equivalencies. And so if they point you to Eastern, and they say, that's, that's not the Greek word there, you can say, well, maybe we have one dynamic equivalency. You have 6,000. So um, let's, you know, believe the King James Bible and believe that, you know, 
God is, is honoring his word and giving us the Bible. Uh, world and age. Should world be age? Okay, Matthew 24, 3. Okay, in the King James Bible, it consistently says end of the world. Okay. In the new versions, including the new King James, it says it's the end of the age. All right. Pat Robertson has a book called The End of the Age. Okay, now what happens when we get to the end of the age? We turn over the page and we have a new age. And that's why we're looking for the new age of Aquarius or the new age, whatever. It's a time period. Okay. Now, okay, now the Greek word there, aeon, can be translated world. It can be translated age. In the King James Bible, you will see that word translated as both world and age. So that means it can mean both things. It can mean a physical universe, the world system, or it can mean time period. In the NIV, sometimes they have it as world and age. So there are no quarrels that it can mean both. All right? And so the context is going to tell you what you know, whether it should be end of the world or end of the age. Now, let me talk to you just briefly about lexicons because what that basically is that word age comes from the, the notion of using a lexicon. And um, wh where someone would get that? Someone would get the notion that world should be age in most of those places using a lexicon. Now, if you look at um, uh, Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it's 10 volumes, it's about this big. All right, and you look up that word yawn, all right? There will be probably 80% of that that will explain to you why it should be end of the world. There will be 20% of that that will say that that particular verse there should be age. Now, what, what is that 20%? Where are they getting their readings from? Let me explain to you what a lexicon is, a Greek dictionary. All right? Um, Kittle was an unsaved person. I talk about it in my book how he was uh, tried for war crimes and the death of 5,000 Jewish people for slandering the Jewish people. He would slander them. He would say all kinds of terrible things about them and incite the German people to kill them. So Kittle was Hitler's propaganda high priest. Okay? During the same time period when uh, Kittle was writing the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, he was also editor and writing for Adolf Hitler's propaganda newsletters about let's hate the Jewish nation, let's hate the Jewish people, they're the pro reason for all of our problems, okay? And so this man was anti-Semitic. Even if you look up in the, in the Jewish dictionary, they'll tell you that he, both he and his father were anti-Semitic. But anyway, Kittle wanted to secularize the lexicon. Now, where a lexicon comes from, it, it basically, it, it's something that gives us something called philology and it gives us etymology. It gives us the history of, the, of a word, where did the word come from? And philology is what does that word mean within a culture? or how is, is culture expressed in that word, okay? So they will take quotations. Now, just I'll give you an example today. If we wanted to find out what love was, and if we asked the pastor's wife here, she'd tell us that meant charity, okay? Because she knows the King James Bible, she knows the Lord Jesus Christ, and she'd tell us that it means charity, okay? If we ask Hugh Hefner, what does love mean today? He's going to tell us something completely different, okay? Now, both of those are living in the culture at the same time. They're using the same word. They have a different definition for it. What a lexicon will do, it will take those quotations. Hugh Hefner says it means blah, blah, blah. Okay? Uh, you know, the pastor's wife says it means blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then in Kittle's lexicon, we're going to present both of these. Now, what has happened in the lexical information for seminary students is they just sort of get rid of that 80% that was the Judeo-Christian tradition. And now they have lexical information that just comes from Plato, Aristophanes, uh, Aristides, the Neoplatonic people, the Gnostic people, the people who believe that time evolved, that the, we were in a series of ages, that time went on and on and on and on like this, and that we're going to be coming to a new age. And so hence the idea of a new age. So I think that rendering, particularly in the New King James, that we're at the end of the age is horrible. Because then when he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God in the year 2000 or whenever this is going to happen, let's say we're just getting ready for a new age. You know, we're not getting ready for the end of the world. All right. So that's my explanation on the end of the world and the age. How are we doing on time, Pastor? Am I anybody yawning yet? <laughs> If, if I'm not reading, it's because my, if it's not written neat, I can't read. My eyes are so shot. I mean, I just blew them out when I wrote that book.
Okay. Okay, this question relates to um, the King James translators being the notion that they are the only ordained translators of the scriptures. Then why and what if our language, the English, diversifies, making English more obscure? Okay, uh, that's an interesting notion. The no notion there being, I think it's sort of a misrepresentation of King James Bible believers. The notion that God did something with that King James Translation Committee that was never done before in history and that no one before that time had the word of God. Okay, and that is not true. It's that heaven and earth would pass away, but his word would not pass away. And so if we look back at... Um, uh, back in the history of the church and at the early manuscripts, okay. I want to give you an example of what has happened with the different versions. Okay, looking back at the old Latin, okay, two to one it agrees with the King James. The Peshitta, three to one, it agrees with the King James. The Gothic, Three to one, it agrees with the King James. The Armenian, three to two. The Ethiopic, the King James dominates. Okay, the King James text type has dominated throughout throughout history. Okay, eight, we have 87,000 citations of church fathers from the first, second, third, fourth century. Those predominantly two to one agree with the King James reading. So we have attestation to those King James readings, the King James text type throughout history. God has preserved His Word to all generations. Now, if you want to look at something interesting, there's a book called Boswell's Parallel. And in Boswell's Parallel, he's got the Gothic, which is about 350. Okay, and you can still read it. There's a, if you get the Gothic translation, there's a dictionary in the back. It's still pretty easy to read. Okay, 350 AD. You've got the Anglo-Saxon. Now, Anglo-Saxon is not too difficult to read for the average person because our, our English language has Anglo-Saxon roots. You look at the Anglo-Saxon, about 600 to 900. Okay, this is all in Bosworth's parallel. Then you look at Wycliffe's in 1381, and then you look at Tyndale's in 1526. It is all the King James text type. This shorter Roman Catholic NIV type text type is not there. And so this type, these readings have always occurred throughout the history of the church. The church has always had this King James text type. So it just didn't pop up with the King James translators. Okay, now the question about what if the King James language, what if the English language evolved? Let me explain to you something about the history of the English language. The English language came from the Anglo-Saxon, but also came out of the Old French. It also came out of the Old Latin. Okay, there are a number of different roots that were bringing to bear to create the English language. We did not really have the English language until approximately 1600. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but if you saw Wycliffe's translation, 1381, you couldn't read it. You, see, you, know, you know the Bible, so you could probably, well, there's sort of a got in there. That might be God, you know what I'm saying? But 1381, we did not have what you'd call the stabilized high English language. It was still reading so much like the old French, the old Latin, the old Anglo-Saxon, some Gothic things pulling in here, and the West Germanic and the, uh, the Indo-European roots of all this coming up. It was not the formalized English language that we know you couldn't read it. Okay? And it wasn't until right before the King James Bible that the English language stabilized and became the English language. We're English-speaking people. Okay? And so when the English language stabilized, and became, the spelling sort of stabilized somewhat. God gave us an English language translation of the Bible, which would be perfect from one generation to the other. And the reason he wants it to be perfect from one generation to the other relates to intergenerational teaching. Okay, remember Lois and Timothy and Eunice, the grandmother teaches, the granddaughter teaches the, the kid, you know, it goes down. Well, if I have the King James, and you have the New King James, or my daughter has the New King James, and her daughter has the KJ21, how are we going to have intergenerational teaching? It says in Deuteronomy, you know, when you get up in the morning, you say scripture verse to your kids. At night, you say the scripture verse. When you're sitting, when you're walking, you're saying scripture verses. Well, if I've memorized King James Version, shame face in this. And I say that to my little girl, and she's got King James. Can you picture confusion there? God is not the author of confusion. And so um, when people say that the English language is changing, um, let me point you know, if the English language changes or we need easier to understand versions. Let me mention several things about that, okay? There will never be an English Bible better than the King James Bible because of something called the derivative copyright law. Okay, the derivative copyright law says that if there is an existing work that's in the public domain, like the King James, you cannot copyright from that work a new work 
unless it contains, and let me read that derivative copyright law for you, unless it contains a substantial amount of new material, okay? So the King James translators, their knees start knocking here, and they said, oh, quote, I'm reading the derivative copyright law, making minor changes or additions of little substance, you know, let's get rid of purloining, let's get rid of concubescence, you know, all those excuses that they said for making the new King James. Um, Making additions of little substance to a pre-existing work will not qualify the work as a new version for copyright purposes. The new material must be original and copyrightable in itself. Okay, so here we have the King James Translate, the new King James Committee, and they're sitting around with the derivative copyright law. And Thomas Nelson gave them all this money to do this, and it's got to be copyrightable because that's the only way you get your money back at your, back at your house. <laughs> okay. um, so they're looking at the King James, and the King James says, smell. Well, that's not archaic, okay? So we'll change it to savor in Amos 5, verse 21. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2, the King James says house. Well, that's not okay. We'll have to change it to habitation. So they change it to habitation. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 3, the King James says give. They said, well, what? that's not okay. Let's call it gratify. All right. Isaiah 28, 1, verse 4, the King James says fat. Okay. They said, well, that's not archaic. Let's call it verdant. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Isaiah 13, 12 it says, man. Oh, boy. It's not archaic. And I, let's change it to mortal. That's good. <laughs> well, now, we're doing this because of the derivative copyright law because we can't just take out purloining and concupiscence and copyright this work because it will not be, quote, substantial changes. You have to essentially change the essence of what you've done or else it's just a ripoff. Okay, and so that's why the King James, the New King James, and the KJ21 were such disasters. I have a collation out there. It's a free thing. This is what it looks like. We brought about. If everybody will just take one per family, but it's a coll it's a collation of the New King James. I've got about. Uh, this was done very very quickly. A um, hundred or so verses compared. All these are showing where the King, the New King James, always uses a harder word. It just always uses a harder word. Where well, the King James has evil, okay? Now, there's something in, in uh, one of the textbooks I wrote for Kent State University was called Design, Process, and Cognitive Beha Behavior. I've always studied how people think, how the mind works, okay? In cognitive behavior, there's something called cognitive scaffolding, all right? So you have the word evil. And I said to my little girl, what does that word mean, evil? She said, that means like devil. Cognitive scaffolding, E-V-I-L. It's the same thing. Um, the word shamefacedness. I said to her, what does shamefacedness mean? She said, oh, your face. You're ashamed. You know, she, little kids know if they're bad. Are you ashamed? You know, they know shame and they know face. Okay, um, the new versions don't have sh words that break down like that. Okay, the King James says, be careful for nothing. The new versions say, be anxious for nothing. Okay, the word anxious does not allow for cognitive scaffolding. Care. Full. So I taught my little girl to read. She's now eight and a half years old. But when I was teaching her how to read, I said, we, I was teaching her using the King James Bible. And I said, what does care full mean? And so we break it down. I said, what does full mean? She goes, oh, all your glasses all the way to the top. I said, what does care mean? She goes, oh, I care about something. And I said, wouldn't, you want to be, wouldn't that be terrible to be just so full all the way to the top about things you cared about and worried about and all this? She understood that anxiety. As we were going through this, I saw where the King James Bible is so full of cognitive scaffolding because it has Anglo-Saxon words. 95% of the words in the King James Bible are Anglo-Saxon words, which are one or two syllables. Okay, the words in the new versions are Latinized words, three or four syllables that do not break down for cognitive scaffolding for children to learn. And so when people say, well, what happens when the language changes, that's really a ruse because that example I gave you, um, King James Old, New King James, elderly, okay? They had to do that because of the derivative copyright law. Um, give you another example about uh, when the language changed. We have a lot of funny things supposedly happening because the language is changing, okay? We have the word hell in the King James Bible. With these terrible archaic words like hell and God and Jesus and Christ and all that sort of thing. Uh, if you look at the new versions, you won't find those words in there anymore. But if you go to a bar, I think you'll probably hear a lot of those words. And so uh, the notion that they're contemporizing the language is probably not true. Now, take the, word, take the New King James where we have the word Hades in there, which is simply a transliteration. It's an exact English equivalent of the Greek word that's there, Hades. Okay? If you ask a young person in the United States, uh, would you like to go to hell? 
Okay, our culture, philologically, has given that child an image, that young person, of what hell is. Our culture, and that's through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, has built into the culture a picture of what hell is. You couldn't say, you know, someone is going to hell without giving them a, a terrifying idea, okay? So if a pastor said, if you don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll go to hell, the culture has built up within that person a terrifying idea about what hell is. It's not a good place to go, okay? It's a very simple word. People still use it to swear with, okay? Now, we have the New King James updating that for us because no one says hell anymore, okay? And they have Hades in there, okay? Now, if you said, if you are in a church, on some, some mother drags her teenage son to church, and she says to, you know, the pastor's up there, and he said, if you don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will go to Hades. And the kid says, oh, that's pretty good. Because when he was listening to a Styx album the night before, that Styx album said that there's a place called Hades, and if you kill yourself, you will go there and you will party forever. Okay? And so the culture is taking that void. You know that when there was a man who had the seven demons in him, or however many demons, and they left him? And when we have that void, when we have those 64,000 missing words in the NIV, when we have these missing words, when we have these words taken out that the culture has built a philological explanation for to people, we take them out, those seven devils come in and they fill up that space. Someone ran a thing on the Internet for me to find out the word Hades in heavy satanic rock music, and it's all over. Hades is this place where you go and you kill your... If you kill yourself, you'll go there and you will party forever. And so when these New King James people say they're communicating with the young people, um, I suspect they're not, not communicating with the young people. They're taking these terrible archaic words like God out. Okay, the NIV has taken God out 468 times, that terrible archaic word God. Okay, the New King James has taken that terrible archaic word God out 51 times. Now let's look at something like that terrible archaic word blood. Okay, the New King James has taken that terrible archaic word blood out 23 times. Okay, the uh, NIV has taken it out 41 times, and the New American Standard has taken it out 39. These are not archaic words, okay. But they are words that are distinctively Christian, that identify the Christian religion as different from the, what do you want to call it, the, um, the New World religion. Okay. Now, if I've already answered the question, I'm putting the card down. Like, how, what got you started writing the book? So I already answered. Oh, somebody listened to one of my tapes, and it sounded like I said we didn't have guardian angels. Um, boy, I don't know. I know the new versions substitute the term guardian angel for something else. I believe that I'd ask your pastor that question. I, I think that guardian angels are kind of Catholic, but uh, I, I, there's no doubt that, that angels have helped me out a lot of times, but I don't know, you know, about some guy over my head right now saying, hi, Gail, you know, holding on to my lapel or something. You know, what about the Southern Baptist Convention and the, and the NIV? Um, you know, someone told me one of the biggest problems at the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries is pornography and marijuana. And so when I heard that, I thought, well, no wonder they don't like the King James Bible. I mean, seriously, if that's what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries, good night. No wonder they, they don't have the discernment to know. And I heard that. I said, oh, you're kidding. I thought these were guys that... But... Uh, Oh, this is interesting. Okay. Um, someone wants to know about the woman taken in adultery. Is it in the earliest text? This is John 8, uh, 1 through 11, uh, that this was added to the King James Version. Um, let me talk to you about that. There was a gentleman. Now, I'm not going to give you the, the manuscript. Well, do I have the manuscript evidence for that with me? Let's see. John 1 through... No, I didn't do that one. Okay. I'm trying to keep a list of all the manuscript, everything, so everything I can. I don't have that one in this file. But um, the woman taken in adultery is one of the 12 most questioned verses in the King James Bible. Okay, there was a woman taken in adultery. All right. Now, 
Rather than getting into the textual information, and I can tell you briefly that it is in the oldest manuscripts, it is in most of the manuscripts, it is in the early church fathers, and we see it in the versions moving up throughout history. So there's absolutely no reason why we wouldn't believe that. But uh, we've talked about some negative things tonight. There's something that God has done that's very good that has nothing to do with this, but uh, I'll get back to this in one second, but I want to explain it to you what's happening. There's a journal called um, Statistical Science. This is, this is what it looks like. Okay, and You're welcome to look at this on the table if you, when you go out. You can either read it this way or you can read it this way because this is the kind of... If anyone takes statistics in college, you know what a terrible course that is. Okay, St statisticians are probably the most brilliant people on the planet. I mean, the math that, this, that they do, statistical scientists, is, is the highest level of mathematics that's alive, that's you know, available. But anyway, the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, as well as Statistical Science Magazine, this is Volume 9, 1994, printed an article called Equidistant Letter Sequence in the Book of Genesis. Okay. Now, these are not Christians or Bible believers or anything like this. But some Hebrew scholars took the Hebrew text and they found embedded in that Hebrew text the names of people the day they were born, the day they died, that person's name, and also the city where they were born and died in. Okay, And uh, now, when, you're in a, when, when you get in a magazine like this, it's, co it's what's called a juried magazine. Okay, you don't, get, you don't just publish this yourself. All right? There's a jury that, that reviews what goes into Statistical Science magazine. The jury has a uh, Yale mathematician, two Harvard mathematicians. Okay? Those men said, and I'll quote, the phenomena cannot be attributed to anything within the known physical universe. That's what these men said. Okay. These names are actually embedded in the text. And so these names are names of people up to the 1900s. All right. Now, interesting, in Revelation 22, it says this book, the book of life. Okay. Now, something else that it says, it says, if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take his part out, the book of life, out of the things that are written in this book. What if... When these people were taking their name out, you know, taking things out, the woman caught in adultery or this one or that one, they were taking their name out at the same time. Because these statisticians have proved, and please look at this before you go, it's, it was also in Bible Review, October 96 issue. That's something that we, this is kind of hard to come by. But Bible Review, October 1995, and that's, that's a bunch of real dead liberals, you know. Um, and they printed it, and they're just kind of shocked about it because... This, the, the, the statistical um, chances of this occurring are one in 50 quadrillion. They found that you know, people's names, so it's, it's, it's like the book of life. You know, our names are in there. The, the Bible is the book of life. Okay. Equidistant letter sequences means it would be like John, J, skip a space, O, skip a space. But mathematically, this is why the mathematicians were so in awe of it, there would be a, a mathematical rationale about how it skipped one, or it'd skip two, or it'd skip four, or it'd be vertical and it'd skip three, or something like this. But all these names of people that lived in the 1800s, the 1900s, whatever, you know. So I would suggest going to your library and get a get copy of the October uh, 1990, let me get the exact, Bible Review, October 1995. They can get that through interlibrary loan for you and reading that for yourself. And if that doesn't raise the hair on your arms, nothing else will. Now, the reason I mentioned that was there have been people in history past who have done these studies relate, relating to the mathematical rationale behind the Bible. And there was a gentleman named Ivan Panin, who was a Russian mathematician. He uh, was a little bit of a liberal, you know, so he wasn't like a, a super Bible believer or anything. But anyway, he was looking for mathematical rationale behind the, the text, the questioned texts in the King James Bible. Okay? And so he took the one this person's asking this text question about, he took John 8, 1 through 11, and he was working with this math, and the mathematical rationale that he used was everything in the Bible is based on um, a derivative of a number divisible by seven. Okay, now, let me show you what he did with Mark 16. Okay, but well, maybe I'll tell you why I'm telling you this before I tell you all this. He proved with this mathematical rationale that he came up with that all of those question texts in the King James Bible were in fact part of the Bible. And the woman caught in adultery was one of the ones that he proved belongs in the Bible. Okay, now this is how he did it, all right? And I have the, I have the statistics for, no wait, 
Yeah, the, I have the statistics for Mark 16. I don't have it for the one the woman caught in adultery. But Mark 16, the questioned words, where they say what well, doesn't really belong in the Bible, had 175 words in it. Okay, that's 25 times 7. It's, it's divisible by 7. Okay, there are 98 vocabulary words. 98 is 14 times 7. There are 98 nouns. 21 is 3 times 7. Uh, nouns beginning with a consonant is 14. That's two times seven. I mean, he went on and on. The number of Greek words, the number of Greek vocabulary words. I mean, any way he could push this thing. And in the part that was questioned, see, in, in the regular text of the Bible, it always came out divisible by sevens, always divisible by sevens. So he would do that, and he would take these questioned parts, and they would come out divisible by sevens. And the woman caught in adultery was one of them. Now, an interesting thing about this um, article in Statistical Science, they took the Samaritan Pentateuch, which the NIV, and you'll see that if you look at the preface to the NIV, they took the Samaritan Pentateuch, which they used to correct the uh, Hebrew Masoretic text with, and they tried it with that, and it doesn't work. This thing here doesn't work at all. They tried tons and tons and tons of things, and it doesn't work with the things that the NIV has been using to replace the Hebrew ben Hahim or Benic Bible. Okay. So, um, okay. Now, um, the Hebrew there is Hillel, Ben Shakar. Okay, so if you're looking at the Ben Hakim Rabbinic Bible, which is the Bible underlying the King James, it will say Hillel Ben Shakar. Hillel being the word that they're translating Lucifer from. Ben meaning son, like um, you know in Hebrew when they say Ben, it just means son. Ben Shakar. Okay, Shakar is one of several words translating morning or dawn. So it's Hillel Ben Shakar. Okay. Now, let's look at the etymology of what's happening in that verse. Now, the, the question comes from the NIV people and the footnotes in the New King James, and they say that it shouldn't be Lucifer. All right? They say that it should be morning star, son of the dawn. So the NIV says, how are you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? All right? So we've got a morning star, son of the dawn. We've got no Lucifer at all in the Bible. If anyone says to me, the King James... Um, or the New King James, or some of these other versions are the same as the King James. They've just updating things. I say they've taken out the two major characters of the Bible. They've taken out Lucifer, and they've taken out Jehovah. If someone wrote the biography of your life, and they took out your mother and your best friend or your husband, it would be like, well, wait, this is not a biography of my life. They've taken out the two main characters, Lucifer and Jehovah. And so without those two people in the Bible, the New King James has no more Jehovah anymore. So it, it's, the more you study about the New Age movement, you start finding out who they think Jehovah is. There's a book on the bestsellers list right now. It's called The Origin of Satan. It's by a Princeton University professor. And in that book, she's very Gnostic. I mean, she's just immersed in the Nag Hammadi things. But anyway, she talks about and it sort of pushes her belief that Jehovah is Satan. This is a very strong belief that's being pushed throughout our culture today. Now, you don't get this in Bible-believing churches. So Jehovah's got to be taken out of the Bible, so he's not in the New King James anymore. But back to this. How should this be translated? Okay. Now, the word for star in Hebrew is kokab, K-O-K-A-B. It's not there, all right? God knows the word star, all right? God used the word star 35 or 36 times in the Old Testament, K-O-K-A-B. When God wants to say star, he goes K-O-K-A-B in Hebrew, all right? So why would they say it should say morning star if the word K-O-K-A-B is not there? All right, the word star is not there. But he just wanted to make sure you knew that he knew what the word star was. Because in the very next verse, in verse 13, he uses the word star, okay, talking about something else. Um, the, the star sang for joy, the morning star sang for joy, whatever it is. He uses the word star there. He uses the word cocab there. He doesn't use it in Isaiah 14, 12, okay? Now, the term morning star, what if God wants to say morning star? Maybe it should be morning star. The term morning star is in, is in Job 38, 7. All right, Job 38.7 has bokeh, kokab, morning, star. All right, it's got the word morning, it's got the word star. So if God wants to say morning star, he knows how to say it in Hebrew. And it's in Job 38.7, all right? And he doesn't, he doesn't use that, any of those words, in Isaiah 14.12. He uses the word Hillel. Okay, now, the, hel the word Hillel is a singular masculine pronoun. All right? And it doesn't exist any place else in the Bible in that form. It only exists in the form of a verb and exists in Job 29.3 where it says his candle shined. 
Okay? And they translate it as the word shine there. All right? So we know that the, God meant something like about shining. Okay, now hubcaps shine. You're thinking, oh, a star shines. Sure, but so do hubcaps. Okay, so we, we didn't say the word star. If we wanted to say the word star, we could say that. Okay, now, if Hillel means shine, if you look back at the etymology of the word Hillel, you've got Hel, H-E-L. For those of you who know Greek, Helios. Okay, that's the sun. Um, it's just the, the root word for the word sun. And then El, if you look at the Ugardic, you've got El, which is El, like Elohim. It's the word for God, sun god. So basically you have Baal there, worship of the sun god, who Lucifer has always presented himself as the sun god. Okay, Lucifer. Well, now how did it become Lucifer in our English language? Now, if you look back at all the words in the Indo-European root family, okay, you will find that the word sh shining is Luke, L-E-U-C. Okay? If you look back at the West Germanic, you will see um, Luke Tam, L-E-U-K-T-A-M. If you look back at the Greek, you've got Lukos, this, this bright white shining light. Okay? So the word historically has always a Luke kind of word. So when it moved into the Old Latin, it moved in, as you'll see in the Spanish Bible, as Lucero. Okay? Like in Latin, lux is light. Fur is transfer something. Okay? Like a ferry boat, fur. I'm going to ferry you across, transfer. Okay? So loose, luck, it's a fur. I'm going to carry the light. So he's going to carry the light. Okay, so he's the light bearer. So if you look at the old Spanish Valera, you're going to find Lucero. Okay, if you look at Coverdales, you're going to have Lucifer. This kind of a word, Lucifer, is just etymologically an absolutely perfect rendition of that hell out. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. It just moves into the language perfectly. And these people will pretend. They'll say, well, it just came from the Latin. Well, sure, Latin is part of it. But if you look back at the Proto-European roots of the whole thing, you can see that that kind of word has always meant that very, very thing. And so that's an act, you know, they just don't know etymology, I'm afraid. And so they will try to, people will try to pretend because the NIV doesn't have Lucifer anymore. Okay? It has Morning Star. And by having Morning Star, what they're doing is they're taking you to Revelation 22.16, where it says, um, I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Okay? So what is Jesus, what is God the Father going to give us? According to the new versions, he's going to give us Lucifer. Okay? And I think this is what's going to happen when he sitteth in the temple of God and showeth himself that he is God. And they say that Lucifer is God. He said, I will be like the Most High. He wants to be worshipped. And it's just this name game and this name change. And that's how he's going to move in. You know, they don't, they don't want the name um, Lucifer, Lucifer being there. Um, let me explain one other thing while I'm talking about that. It relates to this Mobius that's on the cover of the New King James. A logo on here. Okay. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this logo. But it says that it's the symbol for the Trinity. Okay. Now, as I told you, that verse says we ought not to think the Godhead is like anything graven by art. Or man's device. Now in art, there are three different kinds of art. There's um, representational art, like a painting. There's stylized art, where you just abstract something away. And then there's abstract art, which is what this is. This is abstract art, but it's still art. And we ought not to think the gods has anything like um, this. But this picture, if you trace this, this symbol back, you will trace the symbol back to Pythagoras, about 500 BC. Pythagoras was initiate into the Egyptian mysteries. Pythagoras, if you remember from geometry, invented the Pythagorean theory and all that sort of thing. He was a brilliant mathematician, but he believed that numbers had supernatural powers. So his initiates would communicate with number symbols. So he would make this little 666 thing, just like this, and if somebody had that on their little thing, and they were... So, you know, like how the Masons or these different people communicate with one another. If they had their little number thing, that meant, hey, I'm an initiate into the Pythagorean mysteries. Okay, so they would use this little, little um, thing to represent that. Okay, now, the, this symbol uh, and other symbols like, you know, this, this is the 666 one that we have on the front of the New King James. But it's sort of, uh, I can't trace it back, um, you know, after Pythagoras, I believe it went into the Masonic whatever, you know, and, I'm, and I haven't been able to, I'm working on this right now, but I haven't been able to find it until Aleister Crowley, who was the arch-Satanist's 
around the year 1900. Okay, Aleister Crowley invented something called the Third Order, York Order of Freemasonry. Okay, and he said that that was the order in which he blasphemed God the most. And what he would do is he would have these people being initiated into this Third York Order of Freemasonry. And these men would stand in this position, three men. Okay, and then you've got three men, and then they would hold hands and touch feet. I have a picture of it here if I can. But, I mean, you have men ha holding hands and touching feet. It's like, don't do it, you know. <laughs> it's not a good thing. But now this is a picture from an old Masonic book. But these three men are holding hands and touching feet. They put their feet in this little triangle like this, which is the inside shape on the New King James. And then they put their arms, and they cross them, and they lock them. Okay, and they, say, they blaspheme God. They say, Job, Bull, On, which is Jehovah, Baal, and On. Now, Baal... We know we're not to have the name of Baal in our mouth, the Bible said. On is the Egyptian sun god. Now, Jehovah, they believe, is Satan. And you have to read a whole lot of Gnostic material to, to get back to that. But Job only on is, is Satan, Satan, Satan is basically what they're saying. But these three people, these three men hold hands and they put their arms like this. Now, um, John Ankerberg did an uh, expose on masonry. And he had, to, he had these people represent, uh, what's the word, simulating this third order of the York Rite of Freemasonry. And they get these three men standing and they get their feet in this little triangle together, you know, forming that little center part of that New King James logo. And then the right arm would go over and the other arm. And then he did an aerial view of it for this. But he didn't know what he was doing. You know, he didn't know. He just knew that he was, he didn't realize that what the symbol was. It was the symbol on the New King James. But they put their arms like this. The arms going over and going under are identical to this, the symbol on the, um, New King James. And then you can see, and I wish I had a blown up picture of this. I may have a blown up picture of this, but um, the symbol is, in fact, the same as the New King James. You just, it, it represented the serpent and the devil. And I don't know if, I can, if you can see that, but it was a serpent coiled up in the 666 form. Okay. And then you've got his legs on the bottom down there. And they've taken this and they've done it again, you know, in the same the same format. Now if you want to see the symbol someplace else, get a Led Zeppelin album because they've got it on there because Led Zeppelin follows Aleister Crowley. That Jimmy Page who runs Led Zeppelin or ran Led Zeppelin bought Aleister Crowley's mansion and so that's why they've got this symbol on there. It's also on the, sim on the cover of the Aquarian Conspiracy, that New King James book. So this, this uh, thing where it says he, he sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. We wonder, why is he at the doors? Why is he in the church? Calvin said, you know, why are you so surprised that he's at the doors in the church when it says he sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God? You know, I mean, he's moving in and he's going to move in through the churches. There's a, there's a group called the um, uh, Lucius Trust. And Lucius Trust... Um, if I can find... Lucius Trust uh, started out around 1900. And um, they were first called the Lucifer Publishing Company. Okay. Now, for public relations reasons, they changed the name of it to Lucius Trust or whatever. But the, their idea was the promotion of Lucifer. Now, this is what they said. Someone faxed me their proceedings from their 1904 meeting. And this is what they said in their 1904 meeting. I believe it is through the churches and not through the Theosophical Society, that being Lucifer worshipers, that Theosophy, that is the worship of Lucifer, must and should come to large bodies of people in the West. Okay, And then they go on in these proceedings to talk about infiltration in the church, infiltration in the seminaries and those kinds of things. Now, let me give you a perfect example that this is a, uh, uh, Christianity Today. Okay, It's kind of a liberal magazine. They're kind of going off the deep end, all right? But still... It's still Christian, and John Stott, I'm sure, is probably truly a Christian man, okay? And maybe some of the people that work for it are truly Christian people. But this is the sheep's clothing, okay? This is the wolf. This is the back cover, okay? On the back cover of Christianity Today, we have an advertisement for books by John Marks Templeton. John Marks Templeton is a financial supporter of Lucius Trust, Lucifer Publishing Company, okay? He's selling a book here called, Is God the Only reality. All right. And the book promotes pantheism, monism, you are God, you know, and, and on and on. And John Marks Templeton is the one who gave all the money for the Parliament of World Religions back in 1993 and gave the prize to you know, Mr. Colson and all that sort of thing. But he is a proponent of Lucifer 
publishing company. So we have, you know, it's this close. I mean, there, there were a number of pages in between the front and the back cover, but it's this close as far as how far it's moving into the churches and all that sort of thing. Okay, have you heard about the 21st century King James? Okay, let me give you a few problems with the 21st century King James Bible. There are many problems. Uh, the 21st century King James Bible was translated by a gentleman and his three daughters, I believe. Um, they, uh, they may have had the best intentions, you know, no doubt they did. And I would never question anyone's intentions because I'm sure I've done plenty of things in my life with the best intentions and been terribly, terribly wrong. But the, the King James 21 is a Bible that's selling itself now as an updating of the King James text. Now, we know because we know about the derivative copyright law that you can't update the King James text. So the best thing to do when you have purloining, concupiscence, and all that thing, stick a little footnote and put a word in there. But the very, very best thing to do is to use the King James Bible self-contained dictionary. And let me explain to you how that works. For instance, the King James Bible will have the word script in there. Okay. And when I was teaching my little girl the Bible, I thought, I don't know what a script is. You know, I'm going to tell her what a script is, and I don't know what a script is. And she said, well, a script is a bag, mother. And I said, well, how do you know a script is a bag? Because David had, uh, you know, a script, or someone had a script for their journey, you know, or Paul. And I said, I don't know what it is. And she says, it's a bag. And I said, well, where did you get that from? She says, I don't know. I just read it in the Bible somewhere. And so I got my concordance out, and we started digging through. In the Old Testament, there it said that uh, David had a script, comma, even a shepherd's bag. Okay, even means, it's even. I said, well, how did you know that, that was the same thing? She goes, well, even, you know, it means it's even. It's the same thing, you know. Even a shepherd's bag, you know. And, and, and as I'm looking through the King James Bible, there are tons and tons, like a bishopric. What is a bishopric? Okay, that's an archaic word. If people are worried about archaic words, what is a bishopric? Okay, there's another place that uses that exact same sentences and exact same words, and it says, someone else take his office. Okay, so we know bishopric is an office. Oh, if we want to know what the word Christ means, do we need a Greek lexicon? No, we don't. It says, uh, there, there are sentences in the Bible that will say exactly the same thing as Christ, and they'll say the anointed. Okay, so the King James Bible is really its own dictionary. So we really, and then we're safe, because we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. You know, outside the parameters of the Bible, we have no assurances that it is the word God. Proverbs um, 30, verse 5 and 6 says, every word of God is pure. We have no guarantees about the lexicons. We have no guarantees about all that, those sorts of things. But the question about the KJ21, okay, John 19:14, the King James says, Behold your king, capital K, and then I-N-G. Okay, the deity of Christ is there. The, the KJ21 is, Behold your king, small king. Okay. Um, John 12:34, Son of man, capital S, with deity. They've got a little s. KJ 21. Uh, Mark 5, 35, King James Master, capital M. Uh, KJ 21, Little Master. Okay. Matthew 18, the King James is worship him. Um, KJ 21, besought him. So they're not worshiping him anymore. They also confuse, the KJ 21 also confuses the word, capital W-O-R-D, with the little word, W-O-R-D. Okay. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, capital W-O-R-D. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, the small w is the scriptures. Script means right. Okay, but they confuse the two. They have everything capital W-O-R-D. Well, that doesn't work. They start with Barth and Bruner, the liberals, started capitalizing the Word of God because they became very much like the Gnostics. They didn't think God would touch matter. And so it's got to be something up in heaven. But Deuteronomy says it's not, don't go to heaven and say, where is it? It says it's nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Why? that thou may do it. You know, God wants us to do it. He's going to judge us by the word of God. Jesus said, the words that I've spoken on you, they shall judge you in the last day. Can you imagine going to the judgment and, and he says, oh, you know, I forgot to give you guys a regular Bible. I mean, this was wrong and this was wrong and this was wrong and this one was half right and this one was half right and I'm going to judge you by this book. It says, the words that I've spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. It wouldn't be fair if he didn't give us something in our language that we could understand that was absolutely perfect. It would not be fair and he's a very fair guy. But look at the funny thing the KJ21 does. Okay, so much for, let's update the archaic language. King James is, I will, in Titus 3, verse 8. KJ 21, I enjoin. Okay. Acts 27, 41, King James, a place. KJ 21, a shoal. Okay. Uh, Acts 17, 31, his stuff. 
um, KJ 21 his goods. Now, th th these get funnier. Mark 3, 27, King James spoil. KJ 21, despoil. Okay, we're making it worse, kids. Okay. Now, this is funny. Okay, hold on to your seats. Revelation 18, 14, King James lusted. L-U-S-T-E-D. KJ 21, lusteth. Do you see the derivative copyright law in there? It's like, well, we've got to change it some way. Let's go to less of. I mean, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And if you start collating these things, this is what you will find. You will find that they don't really update, you know, whatever. Okay, here's a question. Some say you don't have a theological background to criticize the new versions such as the NIV and the ASB. Where did you get your training and knowledge? Okay. <laughs> Where did I get my training and knowledge? Um, Paul said, though I am nothing. Okay. Um, so I would say I am nothing. <laughs> and God hung the world on nothing. Amen. If you have God plus nothing, you have everything. Amen. All right? Amen. And so um, my theological background, I don't think women should go to seminary. I don't think women should be in the ministry. I don't think women should do that. You know what I mean? I saw a picture of this woman in uh, Christianity Today, as a matter of fact, and I thought it was like, this is how I was before I was saved, and now I'm, you know, like a Christian woman or something. But, I mean, she had this skirt up to her, you know, and like this hair and like whatever, you know. She was an editor for the New King James Women's Edition. And I said, whoa, you know what I'm saying? But um, now, I imagine that woman went to seminary and went through all that. And I don't think that, you know, when you, when you mix that up like that, I don't think you're doing a good thing, you know. I think if men are going to study the Bible, they should do that by themselves. I don't think you have women sitting around in classes. So what is my theological background? I don't think women should go to seminary. I don't think that's right. Um, but, and I will say, as far as my credentials, I'm as dumb as a rock, okay? Um, but if you take a rock that's rough and jagged, all right, and you put it in a brook, and you let it sit there like I laid in bed for six years. And you let the water of the word run over that and get all the rough spots off. Okay, then someday God's going to pick that rock up and it's going to be smooth, okay? And if you know anything about physics, trajectory, that thing is going to fly, man. And it's going to hit Goliath in the head because the problem is pride. All right. And so um, as far as my theological background, it's just myself reading the Bible, um, being a humble believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the women came to the sepulchre. And they've said, they've taken away my Lord. Okay? And that's really the way I feel. When I see 66 times the word Lord is out of the New King James, they have taken away my Lord. You know? And, um, you know, that, that's really, uh, I think the word Lord is out 2,368 times in the Living Bible. So it gets worse and worse and worse. But when we see the difference between the New King James and the Living Bible, we say, well, the New King James isn't that bad. But here's what happens. When you have a little baby, that little sweet baby that was up here, and she starts falling down the steps, it's not the distance, it's the direction. And so what we see happening with the New King James relates to distance and not the direction. And so uh, I would never, you know, it says, so, do we get, Paul said, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need letters of commendation? You know, uh, someone said, what is my background? I'll say, I'm a herdsman. Like Amos was a herdsman. That's who God cho chose. He heard, I was herding those kids at Kent State University. Come on in my office and we'll have a Bible study. We'll open the Bible up and we'll read the Word of God. Okay. Now, I do have a, enough background that I can jump through some of these things. Um, I was just up at Howells Anderson and I got a doctorate in humanities for my research in Greek etymology and philology and Hebrew and all that sort of thing. So I can play that game. But it, uh, God said... Um, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Can you imagine abomination? Not just like, he doesn't think it's as cool as we think it's cool. He says it's an abomination. In Malachi, when he talked about the scholars, he said the scholars have corrupted the covenant, caused many to stumble. The word scholar is never used in a positive context in the Bible. Never used in a positive context. And so uh, when, God, when Jesus was looking for the campers, the 12 campers, he didn't say, scribes and Pharisees, uh-uh, fishermen. <laughs> Okay, because it takes a humble mind. It says the meek will he teach his way. So my recommendation for seminaries is let's have meekness, meekness 101. Okay, uh, obedience 101. It says uh, I have more understanding than my teachers. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy testimonies. So the young men, no wonder they're so confused. If it's pornography and marijuana, they're not keeping the testimonies. No wonder they're not going to, God's not going to open anything up to them. It will be the meek person that he'll teach his way so
That was my question about my credentials. So I'm going to have, here's this first John 5, 7 belong in the sacred te- text. I'm about out of breath, so I think I'll have that be my last question, if that's okay with you. And um, we'll give a little thing here on First John 5, 7, before I fall over, and you all fall over. Okay. <laughs> um, the most criticized text in the King James Bible is First John 5, 7. And there's a book that was just written by a man named Michael Maynard. Michael Maynard has a master's in library science, and the gentleman knows how to dig, and he knows how to find things. Okay? And he has written the most brilliant treatise on 1 John 5, 7. It came out in 1995. When people read this, they will literally weep, because I got it, and we carry it now at um, AV Publications. If you want a ca- copy of our catalog, you can get them at the table. They're free. But get a copy of 1 John 5, 7, this book called 1 John 5, 7, because the man takes the history of the manuscripts. He takes the history of the fathers. He takes the history of the versions. He shows facsimiles of these ancient versions. And when you're done reading that, you will just literally weep at the way we've been lied to about 1 John 5, 7, because the church has always had this in their text. Now let me, this will bore, you know, the other ones, who, those of you who aren't interested in this sort of thing to death. Quickly, let me read to you the lineage or the genealogy of 1 John 5, 7. But then I'll remind you before I I read this and as I'm closing, the Bible said avoid endless genealogies. And so we must remember that our belief in the King James Bible, our belief in the Word of God, is based on faith. It is never based on a genealogy of a manuscript, a genealogy of a text type. Because as we saw, until those papyri were discovered, it didn't look good for us. Okay, as soon as they discovered them, well, now it looks good again. Well, then what if the devil pulls up something he just created in 1888 and says it's 250 degrees? Our, our, the word can't be based on that. Now, the Greek manuscript evidence for 1 John 5, 7 is not strong. Okay, but we have to remember that the word of God, the written word of God, is a type of Jesus Christ. Do you remember there was a time in the Old Testament when Athaliel had killed everyone, this, all the seed but Joash? Okay, there may be a type... A, time in you know, the history of the church when the manuscript evidence is dwindling and Diocletian and all these people, they're trying to burn the manuscripts, trying to kill the people, you know, the head Bibles throughout history. I mean, there's been this uh, rabid attack on Bible believers and Bibles throughout history. And we wonder, where are the manuscripts? It's like, boy, you know, the devil made sure that they didn't, they didn't uh, survive. But um, just as there was only one left for the seed for Jesus Christ, okay, and you know this one woman is going after it, trying to kill him. The same thing has happened with First John five seven, which is a type. In other words, the manuscript evidence for First John five seven is not as strong as it is for other things. But historically, if you look at the lineage, just like if you look at the lineage of Jesus Christ, you will see that the church has always had First John five seven. Okay, let me go back to one sixty eight. Theophilus is talking about First John five seven one sixty eight one seventy seven. The Apologia of Athenagoras. 177. So we're right after the time of Christ. We've got 1 John 5, 7. 215, Tertullian. These three are one. Okay. 250, Cyprian. And these three are one. Okay. 317, Athanasius. 380, Priscillian. 385, Gregory of um, Zanzananzas. 390, Jerome. Jerome even said, quote, the comma is genuine, but has been removed by unfaithful translators. Now this is Jerome back then. But see, way back then, you couldn't lie quite like you can lie today because there were, there were extant manuscripts back then. This is Jerome saying the comma is genuine. Uh, 450, Contra Verimatum. 450, the Speculum. 485, Victor Vitentis. 500, Codex uh, Fresentius. 529, uh, Fulgentius. 570, uh, Cassidorus. Okay, now I can go on for, forever. Uh, 650, the Codex Paulegianensis, 735, Venerable Bede, 750, the Hartland, uh, 850, Olensis, 923, Leon, 988, uh, Codex Toen, Tannis, Latin Manuscript, 1120, uh, the Waldensian Exposition on uh, the Apostles' Creed, uh, 1150, Codex Devonius, uh, 11, 1250, the Acts of the Lantern Council. Okay, we can see John 5, 7 throughout the history of the church. All right. But if you get an NIV, it will say that this does not belong in the text. Where were these people getting it from in the year 100-something? Were they making this up? Okay, they were getting this from true, true manuscripts. Now, now that's looking sort of at the ancient portion of the history of 1 John 5, 7. Let's just look in the English language. Should, should we have it? Okay, 735, Venerable Bede, manuscript E. 
1 John 5, 7, 1400, Paulus, and 14, an English biblical version by Paulus, 1400, 1526, Tyndale, 1833, Noah Webster. So as, back, as far back as 735, when we're looking at the English text type, you know, the English language, it, it, it's in there. Now, let's look at the German Bible. In the German Bible, Luther took out 1 John 5, 7 because it wasn't in Erasmus' second edition. But I have a listing of, excuse me, all the pre-Luther German Bibles. 350, the Augsburg. Three, 1389, excuse me, 1350, the Augsburg. 1389, the Tepel Codex. 1466, the Mantle. 1470, the Egelstein. 1478, the uh, Flansman. Uh, 1476, the Zania. I mean, I could go on to the Zania. I mean, I could go on to, to ad finitum and bore you to death. But the Germans always had 1 John 5, 7. Luther took it out, okay, Two years after Luther, 1477, Zorg put it back in, and it was in until 1956, and now it's out again. And so um, you can trace this. You can look at, at um, any language. I mean, I have listed every language here. Look at the Syriac. It's in five Syriac editions. Uh, Tremalius, it's in Hutter's Polyglot. It's in uh, Jacob of Edessa, 780. Georgian, Armenian, Armenian, Slavic, the Old Spanish, 1543, El Nuestro. Uh, Redentory, it was in there, the switch and the dust, the Bengali Bible. When William Carey went to India, he put it in the Bengali Bible. When you, when you read this book, 1 John 5, 7, you see the facsimiles of there is 1 John, John 5, 7 in Bengali. These people had 1 John 5, 7, but they want to take away from us. Why do they want to take it away from us? Because it's the best attestation to the Trinity. And if you look several verses later, it says this is the true God. Okay, and if we can take away who the true God is, then we can substitute anyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy with that. All right. Now. This dear lady's poured her heart and soul out in here tonight. And she hasn't even begun to scratch the surface of the, the, the material available. An enormous amount of material. There's one thing that, even if you don't understand some of the technical talk, words like extent and so forth like that, you can get a hold of the idea that this woman has done the work. She's done the research. She's read the material. And she's not reading what someone else said about it. She read it herself did the research, and I like especially what she said, and I'll just be a minute, I know, I know you're getting tired, but she said when she approached this, she was not a King James believer. She came to her belief in the King James Bible because of her own research into the material. That's just like Lou Wallace when he set out to destroy Christianity and wound up writing Ben-Hur, you see. Once he, once he found the evidence, searched the material, he became a believer. And uh, this is what we do, and she does, or anyone else, challenge you to think for yourself and dig the material out and read it. And get New Age Bible versions. If you haven't read it, read it. The, uh, she has another book in the back there, uh, uh, Which Bible, I think is the name of it. And uh, I don't know if you have a title for the latest, the one you're working on now, the one that's dealing with the, with the manuscripts of the King James, when this material comes out. And she can recommend a lot of other material available that you can study. And I hope and pray it's a help to you with all my soul. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. I never did like to hold hands with men. <laughs> and now I know why. <laughs> Amen. Get three men together and you got a devil's circle. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll, we'll, ha we'll stand up and, and have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. And I appreciate you coming tonight. I've enjoyed this, folks. I've enjoyed what our sister had to say. enjoyed being with you. Uh, try to talk with each other and, and get acquainted. Yes, ma'am. Right, right. You're right. That's right. I was going to mention that. The latest issue, The Lion of Judah, has a lot of the information she brought out tonight on this statistical analysis. We've got the thing on Ivan Pannon, and uh, a lot of that is in the latest issue. It's the, it's the issue entitled The Living Word, and you can see why I called it The Living Word. And so we've got a lot of the information our lady brought tonight. And we'll have that for you. And it's free. All these issues are out in the back. If you'd like to get the Lion of Judah mailed to you free once a month, uh, all you have to do is call the church office, 
689-4741. You can get us in the phone book. Call, just leave your name and mailing address, and we'll send it to you every single month, free of charge. Eight pages crammed full of news. It'll be full of news, I guarantee you. It will be full of news. Yes, sir. We've got copy. Just take everything out there. All those lines of you to carry them with you. Uh, now, the books now, they're, they're, you, uh, we have to charge for them. But uh, we'd like to give you all that stuff. If I had some rich benefactor, well, we'd, we'd give all this stuff out. But we don't have. We have the richest of all, though, don't we? He owns our cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. Amen. All right, Lord bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Pray for our sister. Would you understand? I know you know that she has a, a, a degenerative di disease. It's a debilitating thing. She works under stress. And it's, she's paid an enormous price for this. And God bless her. I'm telling you, this is the kind of thing that inspires me, somebody that worked like this. I've benefited greatly from her. Amen. Amen. My Father, we thank you. For